We have just reviewed the film on operation and diagnosis of this power steering system because we've got to get the parts of this unit in mind before we go on with this meeting. This month, we're going to cover removal of the power steering unit from this car and how to completely disassemble it. Then, we're going to talk about the points you should watch when you're repairing the unit. Finally, we're going to reassemble it and put it back in the car. Good idea. Then, no matter what condition you're trying to correct, you'll have all the know-how down pat. How about letting me help, Don? I've been wanting to get my hand on that power steering unit. <laughs> Go to it. I never refuse help when it's offered. And the first job you got, my boy, is to get that steering column out of the way so we can get at the unit. There's nothing too special about that. Right, Tech. But there are a few extra things that you have to watch for when you're taking the steering column out, Ray. The first point is the horn wire connector. Be sure to remove the connector before you attempt to slide off the jacket. If you don't, you'll break off the connector contact. And on cars equipped with vacuum brake boosters, you want to disconnect those two clips that hold the vacuum line to the frame so you can drop that line down out of your way. Then, when you're ready to remove the unit, you're going to have to slide the brake pedal outward on the shaft far enough to clear the pedal return stop screw. You're also going to have to turn the pedal back toward the seat of the car so you'll have room enough between the clutch housing and the brake pedal to remove and install the unit. That's right, Tech. And when you disconnect the pressure and the return hoses at the valve body, tie them to the reservoir so oil won't drip from them. And don't start that engine after you disconnect those hoses or we'll all get an oil bath. <laughs> Very good point, Tech. Now, Lou, I'll take out the two mounting bolts at the top of the gear housing while you reach through the floorboard opening and loosen that remaining cap screw that holds the gear assembly to the lower end of the frame bracket then. And, and remember, he said loosen, not remove that screw. Take a look under the instrument panel now, Lou. See those nuts which hold the steering column jacket upper shroud to the instrument panel? Remove them from the two studs. Got them, Don. Okay. Now let's pull the column jacket and the shroud assembly off the steering gear tube. Now drive out that insulator pin which connects the steering gear tube to the tube coupling on the housing so Lou can pull the steering gear tube up and out of the coupling. There we are. Looks like the gear assembly's all ready to come out now. Right, Ray. Just as soon as Lou pulls out that lower mounting bolt. All we have to do is roll the gear assembly on its side and take it out through the opening in the floor. I see you remember to cover those fittings in the valve body with masking tape so the oil won't spill out when you remove the unit. Right, Tech. And now, let's get the unit over to the bench and I'll show you how to disassemble it. Before we start, let's take a look at this valve body with my magic glass. Hey, that's all right, Tech. That shows the valves and the spur gears. It shows up the pistons and the piston arm in the power cylinders, too. But before we can start any disassembly work, we'll have to drain the power cylinder and the worm gear compartment of oil. How do we do that, Don? First, we have to remove the piston arm access plug from the bottom of the power cylinder housing. That'll let the hydraulic system oil drain out. And work those pistons back and forth in the cylinder so all of the oil will be drained out. If you find that worm gear compartment filled with fluid gear oil when you go to drain it, be sure and put non-fluid gear lubricant back in when you assemble the unit. That's a very good point, Tech. And right here, after you've drained the oil, is as good a time as any to remove the piston arm set screw and also the pitman arm. Then we'll disconnect the hydraulic tubes from the valve body and the power cylinders with a socket wrench. Then we can remove the valve body. Now we're ready to remove the power cylinders. But remember that the cylinders must be reassembled in their original positions so the hydraulic tubes will fit. So the first thing we'll do is mark their location with a scratch mark. Like this. Yeah, and don't use a brick punch. Right. Now, we'll loosen these two-cylinder lock rings several turns using a special spanner wrench. Then screw those two special holding studs into the top of the cylinder. Right, Tech. 
Then we place a bar between those two special holding studs we just screwed into the cylinder and loosen the cylinder from the housing. And do the same thing on the other cylinder. Right, Tech. Then we unscrew both cylinders from the housing at the same time. That's to avoid a twisting action that might damage the piston rings or score the cylinders if we turned out one cylinder at a time. How do we get the pistons apart, Don? Very easy, Lou. First, pry out the lock wire from the head of the piston with a screwdriver. Then, remove the three screws from the piston and remove the one piston assembly from the connector. Swing the piston arm and roller against the remaining piston by turning the worm shaft spur gear and remove this piston and connector from the cylinder housing. That's it. Now, let's remove the worm cover and the roller shaft cover. Be careful not to damage the worm cover shims. Push the roller shaft part way out of the housing. Then, slide the worm and spur gear out of the bottom of the housing. And with that worm and spur gear out of the way, you can pull the roller shaft from the housing easy like. Then we take this pair of snap ring pliers and remove the roller shaft inner and outer oil seal snap rings. Then pull out the seals. And now you're ready to start on the valve body. First, we remove the valve assemblies from the body by removing these large snap rings at the outer ends of the valves with these snap ring pliers. Now we can remove the valve body cap and the steering tube spur gear from the valve body. Why don't you take one of those valve assemblies apart, Don, and show Lou and Ray what's inside them? Say, maybe that wouldn't be a bad idea. We just pull this valve out of the sleeve. Then, the dash pot, together with the small and large springs and the ball check, fall out in our hands. And be sure and keep those assemblies together, because the valves have to go with the sleeves they're fitted to. Tell me how that dash pot works, will you, Don? Sure, Ray. The ball check fits inside the dash pot and is held there by the small spring. Oil, under pressure, forces this ball off its seat, blows past the ball and out through a tiny orifice in the dash pot. And that dash pot action is mighty important. It acts as a sort of little shock absorber, so you won't get valve chatter on straight-ahead driving on rough roads. This larger spring... What does it do, Don? Its job is to hold the dash pot into the valve. Now you've got everything apart, so clean them up with solvent and inspect each part. Examine the pistons and cylinders carefully for score marks or scratches. If they are damaged, replace them. And always replace those phenolic rings and synthetic rubber T-rings when you have the pistons out. Look for score marks on the teeth of the worm gear and on the roller tooth. If there are any, and they can't be smoothed out with crocus cloth, replace the parts. Take a close look at the roller shaft for signs of damage from the shaft bearings. If the shaft is scored, you'll have to replace the roller shaft on the needle bearings. And now, if someone will turn the record over, we'll put this unit back together. Remember, every time you disturb a connection where an O-ring is used, always put in a new ring. In this case, you'll have to put in all new rings. That's very important, fellas. The O-rings are listed individually in the parts book. Also, a complete set of O-rings, enough to replace all of the rings in the power cylinder housing assembly, is supplied in one package. Here's another tip. Lubricate each ring before you install it, so the ring won't creep and tear when you tighten the connection. Right, Tech. And use the torque tightening specifications for all screws and connections during assembly. Now we can start assembling the power cylinder, right, Don? That's right, Lou. And there are a number of precautions that we have to watch for. For instance, there must be no clearance between the piston arm roller and the ends of the piston plugs. That is controlled by shims between the plugs and the underside of the piston. To set up the zero clearance, secure the pistons to the connector with the screws, but do not install the lock wires. Then, insert the piston arm between the plugs and check the clearance. The roller should just slide in between those plugs without binding. If necessary, add shims to eliminate any clearance. After we've checked this clearance, we remove one of the pistons so that the assembly can be installed in the housing. When installing rings on the piston, install the synthetic rubber T-ring first. 
These phenolic rings are installed one at a time. Two rings go on each side of the T-ring. And be mighty careful you don't crack those rings when you're putting them on the pistons. Next, we install the roller shaft inner seal and snap ring. Then we can install the worm and spur gear and the roller shaft in the housing. And you want to be careful when you install that roller shaft that you don't damage that inner seal. Better rub a little oil on that shaft before you push it through the seal. Right, Tech. Now we slide the roller shaft through the piston arm. And don't tighten that set screw yet, or you can't adjust backlash between the worm and roller. You're on the beam tech. And that leaves us with the outer seal on the roller shaft to install. After we have installed the pitman arm and the roller shaft cover, set the roller shaft and worm at center position. Turn the worm spur gear to the center position. Then turn the roller shaft adjusting screw in until there's no backlash between the worm and the roller at the center position and for a quarter turn each side of center. Then we go ahead and install the pistons and connector. They go in just the reverse of the way they came out. Now we can tighten the piston arm set screw and lock nut. Then install the access plug with a new gasket. Now you're ready to install the cylinders in the housing. First. Turn the pistons to the center position and screw in both cylinders a couple of turns to align the pistons. Then we turn the spur gear one and three quarter turns beyond center and hold it. Then screw in one cylinder until it bottoms on the piston. Next, turn the spur gear back to center position. Then turn it one and three quarter turns in the other direction. Hold it there and screw in the other cylinder. Now, check the scratch marks to be sure they're lined up. Otherwise, the hydraulic tubes won't fit. And be sure you put new O-rings under those cylinder lock rings. But don't tighten those lock rings until you're sure the hydraulic tubes will fit. Then install a new seal in the valve body cap for the upper end of the steering column spur gear. Now, set the roller in the center of the worm. And be sure the marked tooth on the spur gear is straight up, indicating the center position. Now we're ready to install the valve body on the housing after we put in a new seal and O-ring. And then turn that steering column coupling so the file marks are up and that slot is vertical. Right, Tech. And then you can install the cap and steering column spur gear into the valve body, meshing the two spur gears at the same time. And now we reassemble the valves and lock them into the valve body. Be sure those snap rings are installed with the beveled edges out. Now we're ready to install the hydraulic tubes on the valve body and cylinder housing. Be sure to install the second longest tube first, followed by the shortest. And remember, use new O-rings. Right, Tech. And now let's tighten the cylinder lock rings and get this power steering unit back into the car. You want to put it back, Lou? I sure do, Don. What do I do first? Better install the upper and lower bracket mounting screws, Lou, but don't tighten them. Just snug them up so we can shift the unit around for final alignment. Now, install the steering gear tube by indexing the insulated tongue into the slot of the tube coupling so that the file marks on the coupling and the master spline on the upper end of the tube for the steering wheel are in line. Now, we install the column jacket. Push it upward so the jacket studs can be fastened to the instrument panel. Then we install a spacer tool between the flanged lower end of the jacket and the rubber insulator on the steering gear housing. This spacer helps line up the steering column with the gear housing. And be sure and have that jacket resting all the way around on the spacer. Now, with the column in line vertically, tighten those upper and lower mounting bolts. Sight down the center of the column and see if it is in line with the center of the instrument cluster. If it isn't, Loosen the bracket to frame mounting bolts and shift the housing right or left until the column will line up. Then tighten the bolts. Remove the spacer and push the column jacket down on the rubber collar. And right here is where we adjust the spur gears. We've already talked about that, so just go ahead and make the adjustments. Say, Tech, what's the story on this pump and reservoir? Some parts, like the bearings, the pump shaft, the oil seals and the O-rings can be replaced. 
You'll find the details on pump service in the reference book. Maybe we ought to give him that O-ring replacement story. Hey, Don? In case they ever have to do it. Good idea, Tech. Start out by inserting the special tapered plugs and pilots into the oil passages and screw holes. And those plugs for the oil passages are to keep dirt from falling into the pump. The pilots are used to line up the reservoir mounting screw holes so the screws won't cut up the O-rings. When you connect the hoses between the pump and valve body, be careful not to connect them to the wrong fittings or you'll blow out all the seals. Why don't you finish up by giving the boys the story on bleeding the system of air, Don? A good idea, Tech. First, we remove the cover from the reservoir and fill the system up to the proper level. Replace the reservoir cover and run the engine. At the same time, turning the wheel back and forth from one extreme to the other. And then you turn the steering wheel to the extreme left position and hold it there. Right, Tech. Next, we loosen the bleed screw located at the center of the top of the power cylinder housing. Leave it open until there's a steady trickle of oil without bubbles. Then close the bleed screw. And you finish up the job of bleeding by checking the oil level again. If it's low, add oil. Right you are, Tech. And be sure there are no bubbles in the oil in the reservoir. Bubbles would indicate there was still air in the system. Well, that about covers maintenance of the hydraulic power steering system. This power steering is new to all of us, but we know more about it now than before we started. Let's all study the reference book so we'll know how to service this unit as well as we do the other units on the car. Yeah, Tech. And thanks for giving us a helping hand. <laughs>